Hello and welcome to the final conversation in my dear, a listening eye, the 11 week retrospective series of the extraordinary documentaries made across five decades by the wonderful documentarian Mike Dib. My name is Gareth Evans and I'm the adjunct moving image curator at Whitechapel Gallery. It's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, wherever and whenever you are watching uh, this broadcast, uh, where Mike will be in conversation with the extraordinary public intellectual Lisa Apinanesi. Now she's one of the very few public intellectuals we have here in the UK. She's also an award-winning writer, commentator, broadcaster, key public figure, uh, an advocate for all things that matter in the cultural life of this country. It's a real pleasure to be welcoming her uh, to be in conversation with Mike. They are long-term friends and they share also a mutual friendship with the late, great John Berger. I'm recording uh, this introduction uh, the morning after the conversation because due to technical issues beyond our control, we were not able to join their conversation until after it had started. Uh, they've been talking about uh, their shared uh, uh, friendship with John and also uh, Lisa brought in the issue of the BBC being a key structure in terms of how Mike was able to make uh, the films of his first 20 or 30 years of making. As I said, he's made films for nearly six decades now. Um, and we talked a little bit uh, about the, the public life uh, of cultural broadcasting and how necessary it was to establishing a certain kind of shared language around what television's creative possibilities might be. I'd like to thank everyone at the Whitechapel Gallery, of course, for making this retrospective series possible, and also particular thanks to the season curators, Matt Hall and Colin McAuliffe, who, along with the production manager, Rachel Winton, have delivered uh, this 11-week series uh, to the Whitechapel for us. Many, many thanks indeed to them. So we join the conversation now uh, when Mike is talking about Don Quixote, the book uh, about which, of course, he made a wonderful documentary tracking Don Quixote through the culture. So you'll join him very shortly uh, as he's mid-sentence uh, thinking out loud for us about the book. And just to draw your attention to a little later in the conversation, there is a slight jump cut when they are talking about Elmore Leonard, again, one of Mike's subjects from another documentary. But I do hope you enjoy this conversation and do obviously track down the other two in the series uh, with Jeff Dyer and Yasmin Gunaratnam as well. Of course, alongside all the other programming, the Whitechapel Gallery is bringing you online and very soon, we hope, in person. Many, many thanks indeed for being with us. And now do enjoy the conversation as Mike is talking about Don Quixote. You know, psychological novel and often thought of as one of the original foundation stones of the novel. Uh, but also it discovered postmodernism um, at the same time before anybody gave post uh, gave it a name um, because if you know in the, the second part of the um, novel there's Don Quixote notes uh, going into a going into a shop and realizing he is a character in fiction so you just get this extraordinary moment um, and anyway it was just fascinating and also my professor at uh, university uh, Ted Riley who, for whom I wasn't a terrific student, um, had actually written a um, little essay on the pop, popular cultural forms of, um, I'm going to call him Don Quix, it's kind of easier. Um, and uh, so I dragooned a Professor E.C. Riley, as he then was, and Ted, as he became, um, to help me. Um, and uh, at the end of it, uh, I sent him a VHS of the film and said, dear Ted, here's the only essay of mine you ever liked. <laughs> because uh, I think it was just a, such a, a playful film and I enjoyed so much making it. And I loved the various people I met on the way. You know, Ben Ockrey talked so beautifully about it and then Carlos Fuentes and, and then Antonio exactly Baez. Exactly, talks wonderfully about it. And, it's, and, and yet alongside all that, you have this novel which has been turned into a landscape. You can actually travel the novel across La Mancha. And of course, Ben Ockrey was talking in a restaurant in Putney called La Mancha. Um, and, uh, and so you have all those very nice um, sequences with um, ordinary people who are just going on the journey of Don Quixote. And then you suddenly arrive in El Toboso, El Toboso and I see a factory called Dulcinea where they're making chocolate. Um, and uh, Dauphinaire, a fantasy figure, has turned into a room, you could, house you can visit. So there's some wonderful, ex anyway, it just seemed to me an absolutely fascinating topic. I'm sorry to be literary, but it seems to me you've made a film about two Dons, one being Don Juan or Don Juan, and the other one about Quixote, as you say. And it strikes me that they're very much mirror images of each other. At least they're both 
have particular kinds of fantasies about women, one idealizing the other the libidinous and I was wondering whether and and they have a companion who takes the mickey out of them um, for one reason which is very different from the other and I was just wondering whether this was a theme this kind of pairing appealed to you in, a, in any way whether you were exploring more than the actual um, I, literary side of Don Quixote and well I think what's fascinating about both of them is both are quintessentially Spanish and yet touch something obviously completely universal. And I think that's fascinating, that it could be simultaneously something so deeply rooted in one culture, but somehow um, reaching out and touching people in um, way outside that culture, brought up in completely different worlds. So there's something about the themes of both of them, which uh, um, have been extraordinary fertile. So it's not to do with concepts of masculinity at all. <laughs> oh no, 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 <laughs> no! But it, I was just not. I was just take, doing that technique of not answering your question, but saying something which I wanted to say, but you didn't ask me. <laughs> um, anyway, look, um, no, but of course they raise those interesting questions, and I think the film raises them too. I hope it does. That's why I'm asking you about it. <laughs> mm. I mean, your films all raise these these rather. Um, interesting questions that one needs to think about. They are films about ideas as well as about what they're actually depicting um, in a visual yeah, well, way. What is important to me is actually that the film is an incredibly rich medium through which to explore ideas. And because you can actually, in, in both Don Juan and, 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 and Don Quixote, you can actually um, go to music, images, literature, you can bring so many different levels of response to the theme. Uh, and you can't do that as you write an essay. I mean, it's a very different sort of essay from the wonderful essays you yourself write, Lisa. You know, it is, it is a very personal film, but it also is a film which actually exists through the personal responses of many other people, which I just then make an arrangement around and to whom I'm asking specific questions because those questions are so important. I'm proposing, uh, and they are in a way organizing the way of thinking about the books or the, or the opera or Don Giovanni or whatever. But is mm. there anything in particular about writing and the people who make it that captivates you um, and, and that plays into the way in which you actually edit your films and put them together? Um, I think each one is, is enormously varied really. Because uh, you know, there's, I'm not as widely read as as many people are. There are the, the books I've made, the writers I've made films with are hugely contrasting. And when I enter the, in, and I only would make a film with someone who's writing and really interests me, or there's a way into that writer's world which is interesting to me, and I feel I can make a film about. Um, but. But, you know, if you think about the um, one I did with Antonio Bayat, uh, that was a kind of home movie. I mean, when I read Possession, uh, I couldn't believe I was reading a novel which was set in the landscape of my childhood. And so that was a chronic, very, very fascinating. And the consummation of this Victorian romance happened in Filey. You know, I never connected Filey with sex at all. You know, Filey was where I grew up. My father was a GP. And, uh, and, uh, and yet it was lovely to, to, to make that film with Antonia and go back to my childhood spaces and see it through the imagination, her imagination, um, see the, the world I grew up in through her imagination. So there was something very personal connection there. And We're going to watch a clip from that in one moment, but I want to ask you one more question before we get to that. You said to me once that your films grow organically and that you have no pre-existing idea of the form. It just, it just comes out of the subject. So let's think, we're, we're moving from Don Quixote and potentially Don Juan as well, which are films about the idea of a particular kind of behavior, uh, really, as much as they are about Spain and music and sexual relations and so on, to, to a film which is a, a portrait that you've called A Curious Mind. Um, was there any 
difference in the way you proceeded in the making of them? Well, obviously, if you're working with uh, making a film with with um, uh, someone like Antonio, you have to make a film which is actually um, create a sort of ambience in which she f uh, feels a great deal of trust, I hope. And I think one of the things I really found when I was making a film with Antonia, uh, that we did had developed this personal relationship. Uh, there was, you know, her childhood, her, her family came from Sheffield, but they had their family holidays in, fam in Filey. So uh, her family snaps of holidays in the 50s were the same as my family snaps of hol beach holidays in Filey in the 50s. Uh, we find that we just lived in southwest London. We both had a little house in the Savenne. There was a sort of uh, contingent, and, and, that, and all those features, I think, allowed us to, I, I felt I was really making a film with a cousin or, or a family member. Uh, we even stayed in the hotel, the old hotel in, in Scarborough, which my grandmother owned. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was driving from Scarborough to York to the school that she hated so much and grew up in, I did that journey so often, but suddenly I was doing it with Antonia. So we had a conversation, a completely different conversation about a journey I knew so well. So that was very specific to that film. Well, that's, and I just hope- Let's hope watch that, a bit. All right. Shall we watch a little bit of it? I think it's the most brilliant portrait of Antonia Byatt ever. Let's see it. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit of it. Her most celebrated book, Possession, which won the Booker Prize in 1990, began its life here in the London Library. I love the London Library because you can get at the books. You know, you can actually go and wander in and out of the stacks. You go and look for one thing, and you find if you can wander through the stacks that you found some quite other thing, which is what you really want to see. I always feel slightly precarious going along these metal things, and it's very important if you're a woman to wear trousers. And you hear this kind of rattle. I've got soft shoes on, but you hear people sort of clattering along here. And slowly your mind would expand into the silence. And in some curious way, this is always connected in my mind with certain open spaces in which I become exactly the same person as the sitting in a library person. Filey and the Yorkshire Moors were freedom and actually being able to breathe and being able to see. And yet the closed space of the library is the internal equivalent of that. It's freedom, it's being able to breathe, it's being able to see. Mike, tell us a little bit more about this relationship, this almost brother-sister relationship you had with Antonia Byatt. This was just after Possession had won the Booker, is that right? No, it wasn't. It was a little later than that. A little later than um, that. that. But it's, I mean, both, both the Quixote film and the film with Antonia were both um, commissioned by Rowley Keating, who you mentioned in the introduction. So that was very nice. And what you realise is that once you don't have designated slots on television for literature, it, book, films about books disappear and films about writers disappear. And what has had gradually diminished are all those safe spaces for the kind of films which I have been lucky enough to make. Um, and uh, that's a very big change. But I think the, the thing about Antonio, was are hugely different people in all sorts of ways. But I think because we just shared this Yorkshire background and and uh, and uh, and you know, the, the, the world I knew: Filey Brig, Marble Hole, Robin Hood's Bay, the Yorkshire Moors, the beach on Filey. I mean, my first school, uh, the garden gate of the school, went out onto the beach. So my first memories are of just running across that beach. And in that clip we just saw, at least we pulled back to see Antonia on that. Uh, in Filey Bay on an absolutely disgusting weather. It was pouring with rain and the wind was high, but anyway, it still felt a really lovely thing to be doing. 
so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I mean, it feels like a, you know, a proper motion picture. <laughs> it's grand. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you manage to get this, this extraordinary detailed uh, aspect of her writing and indeed of her way of seeing the world, way of being in the world. I mean, her fascination with shells and, and insects. But she talks so beautifully. I mean, her conversation is lovely. I mean, she's so eloquent and so... Brilliant. Uh, so brilliant. But also what I found that she was so vulnerable at some levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was... Uh, and, and there was a lovely moment when, you know, when she went back to the school. I had, couldn't believe that someone who's school days are so far away, could be so um, upset by just going back there that um, she burst into tears in the car park and said she couldn't go in. Uh, What's extraordinary, Mike, it's as, if, it's as if this, you know, this film is emblematic of the title of this series because in a sense it is, I mean, I know Antonia quite well, or I used to know her quite well and, and um, the kind of intimacy of the portrait, the way in which you, your quality of listening made her reveal things that she normally absolutely refused to talk about. And to you, she talked about them eloquently. And, and of course, as one would expect with great um, insight. Um, and you got that, you documented that. How did, how did it happen? How, how, how does it happen, you know? Yes. Uh, in a way, every film is about a relationship to a whole group of people. It's like it can be an individual person or it's a group of people. And uh, I mean, what leads me always is, a, is, is curiosity. And also I don't have an agenda. I'm not threatening, I hope. Um, but I am also in my mind arranging images and, and conversations and the juxtapositions of uh, so describe it. You go out, you say, we're going to this beach, Antonia. <laughs> what are you thinking about when you're going to that beach and you've got Antonia by it with you? Well, there's two things, really, aren't you? You're thinking um, the, you have quotations from her, not only just from uh, Possession, but also from other stories and things she's written, in which that space of the world is, is described in relation to the emotional crisis of a character or something like that. And then you've just got um, Antonia in, 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 um, in this place and I just throw questions out and, and, and she responds and, and, uh, and do you have a limited time and where it pours with rain and you have to stop or whatever. So there's a lot of, lot of chance elements and it's just a question of creating the right sort of ambience um, and uh, and it was it, 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 it's rather strange to describe it but it was it felt sort of easy and I was thrilled at how and I just so appreciated the eloquence and how personally she talked and I was surprised I suppose at some of the things she did tell me um, and I was too <laughs> but I also think it's beautifully edited film and I really care about that I think it's, it's the, the balance of all the elements is really terrific and I work with lovely cameramen and lovely editors and so the creation of the thing you know is it's not just me it's a shared experience and a shared creative um, world. I mean if if I were to say Mike Dib I give you a free hand to to um, somehow engage young filmmakers in the art of documentary filmmaking about the arts I mean whether photography or film or or uh, literature, what would you do? I would say don't set off with a presenter. Set off as a topic that interests you as an area and things you want to ask questions and think of the context in which you want to ask, ask questions. Uh, don't try to, try to structure it too much in advance. Allow chance a tremendous space in the in the uh, process. And it's interesting, you know, it's not a film which we can have a clip from, but one of the very first films uh, I did was with uh, a poet called Charles Tomlinson. It was just for a 15 minute uh, contribution to a magazine program. And uh, uh, Charles was a, a close friend of Octavio Paz and they worked together. And that actually probably led to the reason why I made a film with Octavio Paz much, much later. 
Um, but he was had this lovely poem, uh, The Chances of Rhyme, and it says, the chances of are the chances of finding, in the finding fortuitous, but once found binding. And I think that those two lines from his poem about the chances of rhyme have stayed with me as a way of approaching uh, filmmaking, um, allowing chance and then the play of chance to create things which then somehow find their place and echo with other elements and things. And uh, I often think of the um, of a film, which I think I've said before, as a molecular structure rather than a, a rigid linear structure. That, that the order of sequences as they come in the film, often I haven't got worked those out exactly before. Uh, and, uh, and so let chance play its place, have its place uh, and not plan too carefully, but ground, ground the film carefully, but not get stick rigidly. And there's an awful lot of wonderful sequences that happen because a problem occurs and you can't do one thing and you find yourself having to do something else and just reach for the potential of that new situation rather than go on complaining that it didn't happen the way you wanted it. Maybe it's going to happen better because of that. What strikes me about all the films that I watched, and I watched a great many of them again, and some of them had stayed with me very clearly, others less so, but that there was a real... Um, richness to the images and the mixture of the way in which you use music in the films is also quite extraordinary. Um, and well, I mean, there's so many elements. There, there, there are bits of theater in them, even when they're not about theater. I mean, there are bits of enactment. Um, uh, and you put all these things together to, to create portraits as well as chasing ideas about things. I but it's mean, also that, that, that um, because uh, my films are not led by commentary, I'm not, I try to imagine the film without a commentary. Occasionally you have to use a little. So that every time I'm talking to anybody, they are, it, they are carrying, whatever bit I use is carrying the meaning of the film at that moment. And that's hugely important. And so, it doesn't matter whether it's it's um, a worker on a production line or a tourist on the, the La Mancha route in Spain, uh, just having a drink. Uh, if I talk to them because I really genuinely want a response. And I, and I always imagine that that response might find a place in the film. I don't know whether it will or it won't. Um, so so the, for me, the engagement in everybody I meet is absolutely intense for that moment because uh, the film is going to be made of those moments. And I'm lucky enough you know, to, 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 to find wonderful people along the way and all the different people that Antonia talks to in the, in the, um, in the film are uh, just incredibly interesting in their own right. And, and, and so this, I, I, it's, it's enormous pleasure. So, uh, but we better be stop talking about that and maybe talk about other. No, no, I was going to ask one more question before we move on to the next. Clip. Well, let, let's, let's have a different subject rather than. Anyway, you ask your question, you? right? You ask your question. Well, what, what I was going to ask you, really, because it's been on my mind, is that I, I watched the Lorca film again and I watched Pig Earth, which, of course, was the book that I was intimately involved with, John Berger's Pig Earth and, and the film that you made of that. And it struck me that they had a lot of similarities. And I don't know whether it's to do with the way in which you somehow managed to move into, with your camera, into peasant culture or... or uh, I don't really think Lorca and John Berger have that much in common, but there was so nonetheless something very deeply um, akin between those two films for me. What do you think? Well, of course, the, the Lorca film, um, I read a lot of Lorca at, at the university, but also I think Ian Gibson, who I didn't know very well, he was a brilliant student at Trinity, but he was a year ahead of me and I was a rather unbrilliant Spanish student who used to spend a lot of time going to movies. Uh, but we met later and I love Ian and I love his intensity and his curiosity and his indefatigable uh, work as a biographer, but also his wonderful easygoingness, you know, that we didn't plan anything. 
uh, we just were in different situations and we'd create, uh, we'd make sure we planned to be in certain places and to talk to certain people. But I could always rely on Ian um, somehow to spontaneously um, respond to anything I wanted. And also always whoever he was with, he was always wonderful, you know, he, he has a tremendous personality and he loves Spaniards and he speaks the language beautifully, his passion, and he's always curious. And, and uh, so I have to think of, of Ian's being a hugely important uh, component, but also the Loco it was, was um, I think, yes, it was a particularly moving film, I think. I really loved making it. And again, it's beautifully shot and beautifully edited and has a lovely range of different people. Uh, and, you know, talking about chance, um, we filmed with this Peña Flamenca in, in Jimena de la Frontera. And, um, and the following day after we'd filmed this, then uh, one of the um, gypsies um, who was actually playing a guitar he was on his horse and I said, well, can you ride your horse? And he, and I just filmed that sequence where he came down a mountain across a stream and up. And I thought it was the most beautiful shot you can imagine. And in fact, it carried a wonderful, wonderful Lorca poem. And so there's the sort of chance which you are reaching for all the time. Uh, and it's wonderful when the two things come together. Okay, let's move on. We're going to watch a clip from the beginning of the end of the affair, which is your film about Graham Greene and uh, his novel of that name. I am a jealous man. He was forever yes, apologizing yes, for losing his temper, yes, apologizing yes, for being difficult, yes. apologizing for being bloody minded. It doesn't give a wonderful picture of the warm, generous very and gentle difficult. man. Well, very, because he was several people and it was inconceivable that the same person one had had such a lovely time with would then really be uh, so irrationally angry or make trouble. And he liked, he liked things to go wrong. Ah! Green could not do without Catherine, but ultimately had to and therefore recognised that was going to be the case. She began to fall out of love with him earlier than he fell out of love with her. He was passionately fond of her for at least a decade, 12 years. I'm sure he must be the most difficult man in the world to live with. And a letter written by one of the sisters about Catherine, or Bob's as she was often called, revealed increasing tensions. Last night, I am. and jealousy now gives her only one desire, escape. But why do you weep as you still read the end of the affair? I weep because of the anguish of the lovers and the intensity of the love. And do you think she was at her happiest in her life when she was with Graham? I think she was when she was with Graham, but also had Harry waiting at home. But she was very sad when she was ill that she had left, that she had pushed the leaving and said how much she missed him. So, so Mike, tell us about what inspired this film because it's a rather complex setup and, and a very interesting one. Well, it's, it's also it's probably the second home movie, really, uh, though it's not my life, but that uh, the life of, of my wife, Charlie Duran, and, and for whom, whose aunt, whom she was very close, was Catherine Walston, her aunt. Uh, and so um, there in the Walston family household, is a wonderful album of all the visitors and things. And there are all these photographs of, of Graham Green. Um, and, um, and so the, the, it happened that uh, Neil Jordan was making a film of turning the novel into a new movie with Julianne Moore and Rafe Fiennes. 
and it seemed a wonderful opportunity and because um, to make a film about Graham Greene. And I think a lot of people always wanted to make films about Graham Greene and he never agreed to take part in any. So it was a, 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 an exploration of Graham Greene, but it was an exploration of Graham Greene through uh, Shelley's cousin, um, Oliver Walston, exploring his mother's love affair with Graham Greene. And that's a pretty interesting thing. So you just think, well, hang on, that's not that. That's going to be quite interesting. And there aren't many other people who'd have done it as well as, as Oliver did. And we were able to go to their love nests, you know, in Ackle and one in Capri. Um, and there was the film being made. So you had these beautiful, immediately you had these three levels. You had the family story with the letters, the family letters and correspondence. You had the photographs and the family memories of, of Graham Greene. Um, you have that affair turning into the novel of the end of the affair with all the repercussions from that and whether in fact it seems too obvious what it was about and the family's re response to the existence of the novel and then you have the novel being turned into a movie which gives us another level so you can't go wrong somehow if you have three levels which you can play one against the other in interesting moments and interesting ways and I think the other thing which was I was really grateful for is the filmmakers who uh, normally, you know, when a film is made, you just get a, a publicity clip, which is issued. And I was allowed to use clips from the film that actually related to moments in my own film, uh, which is very, very rare. And so it allowed a tremendous, interesting um, play between the movie, the novel, and the real thing. Okay. And put also wonderful people who talk to her. I mean, you know, Shirley Hazard, a terrific writer and a wonderful talker uh, in Capri. And I remember the first phone call when I rang her up, it lasted an hour, you know, somehow she was, she flowed with so many thoughts. So it was just a, a tremendous pl uh, pleasure to be able to, to make it and find that the BBC would support it. Uh, so it was one of those things that arrived, happened quite spontaneously, um, but um, which was very, very revealing, I think. But it's a wonderful story, too, because it's the story of a triangle, which is actually a, a quartet, <laughs> um, yeah. with, you know, in which everyone is involved, and that makes it all the... the um, it should make it easier, but in fact, it makes it rather tenser, more tense. Isn't it? I mean, it, well, it, it was wonderful. Tell, that, tell us all the dynamics. It was wonderful, of course, that um, Anne, you know, one of the children, you know, was so acerbic about Graham Greene and about the whole thing. And I think in a way, uh, that sort of acid, acidic response to the whole thing was tremendously important in the film. It, it, it just read, gave a sort of tension, um, which was, which was terrific. Um, and, um, and you know, the, 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 the it, it did appear that, and also, of course, the eloquence of, of Julianne Moore and, and Ray Fiennes and their willingness to talk about how they approached the playing these parts. And Julianne Moore looked remarkably like um, Catherine Walston herself. Um, so we were very lucky that all the way along we got access uh, to the movie in a particular way. Um, and and um, also were enough people who um, who uh, you, we, we met in Achill or in Capri who were able to just provide wonderful insights into their relationship with Graham Greene. Um, and so it was good family gossip with quite a degree of literary insight, I think. Absolutely, um, and and very interesting playing with 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 the different levels. I mean, the real and the filmed and the uh, fictionalized uh, by Green himself. It was wonderful. But but you know, I'm I, I, the question. I, I it's very hard to ask you because in a sense it's rather daring, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. I mean, do you have any bits of your oeuvre that you're particularly fond of? I mean, or or does that shift every time you're working on a new project? Um, I mean, if I said to you, what's your favorite film of your own, Mike? 
I don't know. I, I I wouldn't want to choose. I suppose you know. I, no, they. I, uh, I think Lorca certainly is one. Um, and uh, and actually, the, the, one of the series which you know it was a series I did about fields of play, something I thought was really important. I mean, I think it's disappeared into oblivion, and probably very few people have seen it, will have seen it. But actually, that was one of the very uh, one of the moments where actually the content, the whole concept of the uh, series of looking at the, the world through the lens of play in all sorts of different contexts. I saw that, it was great. Um, and, and, and that I think was probably the most personal contribution to making an essay film about ideas um, because uh, it, it was generated by my own curiosity and also the fact that I am very interested in play. I love humor. I, I love playing sport. You know, I think there's lots of levels of play that, that um, not, I can't say I've ever been a, a confirmed gambler. That's not one of the things. But I think the the, the extraordinary last film about s strategy, where I moved from noughts and crosses to war games in the Pentagon, they, that was a wonderful, extraordinary journey. And I think it's a, an extraordinarily edited film too. But anyway, that's not really what we... We're supposed to talk about literature, but also, I mean, uh, no, no, we can. It's the last time. This, this is the last conversation yeah. in this series, so we can mm. talk about anything we like. Is there anything you've had to say? Lots of, but but also, there are lots of other films I've, been, I've enjoyed, and of course, the last film I'm making is one of the most extraordinary personal films about a guy. Well, tell, it, tell us a little bit about that well, because we've had a it's yeah. simply that uh, uh, again through an old friend of mine who I met in the sixties, an American. I discovered he was having this extraordinary correspondence with a prisoner in, in solitary confinement. And they exchanged about over 500 letters, something like that. And in the course of which uh, this extraordinarily brilliant um, guy who'd had a terrible childhood and because of it had got himself into jail and had sort of lived in the world of violence until he had an amazing transformation. And the transformation really was uh, through this correspondence with Steve. And um, he developed this passion for painting, but he wasn't allowed painting materials. It's from his hair and synthesized his colors from the sugar coatings and M&Ms and Skittles. I think it's a technique that actually one or two other prisoners have done as well. His work was remarkable and it just seemed to me amazing, you know, how, how um, this, this, and in, in a way the correspondence changed the course of both Steve's life and Donnie's life, except Donnie is still there in jail. Um, and so I set off to, to make a film. Um, and uh, because I, as soon as I saw Donnie's paintings and read some of his letters, a wonderful letters about the power of art and a wonderful essay called The Dungeon Art uh, and Dungeon Art. Um, and uh, I just thought, well, you know, I just make, make, must make this and, uh, and it's been the longest film I ever made in terms of time, because I think I, I first, I looked at the first uh, thing, the synopsis of the, of the idea film I wanted to make, which was in 2012. And here it is finally coming to fruition at the end of this month. Um, uh, and hopefully to be viewed. It's wonderful at that it is. <laughs> but it's, but so, it's, so I just stayed with it, but that's been an extraordinary experience. Uh, spanned, uh, spread over years. Yeah. Not because one was filming all the time, but because one had to stop filming for long periods of time. Yes. Well, we look forward to that. But meanwhile, let's get back to the one more film that we're going to have. Well, we may have two. If we have time, we'll have two more clips. Um, and this is a film about the crime writer, Elmore Leonard, and it's rather different in some ways from the other choice of subjects that you've had. So can we watch a bit of that? I visited the property room yesterday for the first time and I couldn't believe it. 30, 40,000 uh, weapons, no guns, just guns, plus knives and swords and what Anything else? Anything you can think of. And it, 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 probably several hundred thousand crimes represented on those three levels of the property room. Unbelievable. There's a story with each one. There's no question yeah, about that. It's it got to be the best run property office in the whole world. These oh, are this... things that have just came in in the last, just came in this morning from Dope Rage last night. Oh, this is interesting stuff. Oh. Sawed-off shotgun. 
an old flintlock shotgun. Wow. We've got a, a kilo of cocaine here taken from a raid last night someplace, uh -huh. and all the rest of this is envelopes with crack cocaine that narcotic officers purchased last night. Uh -huh. And as you can see, we've got the uh, ceiling full of guns here. All handguns down the other aisle. At the end of each aisle, we've got guns stacked for lack of any place else to uh, to put them and then try to retrieve them when they need them for court. They're all in here. Everything in here is evidence. Uh, so is it all active evidence? All active evidence. This one. Condom, firecracker, and a threat note. That's a pretty good combination. That's pretty the good. way this... Uh, I mean, you can go down the list of tags and see everything in the world that you can imagine. I imagine just you everything. have seen everything. I mean, what? just literally. But I've got right, a, so I'm writing a book now where a guy's going to be selling these. Is that right? Yeah, in Colombia, or two Colombian uh, customers. Well, somebody's selling an awful lot of them now because oh, yeah. they, are, they are everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So there we go, Elmore Leonard. What what made you choose to make a film about Elmore Leonard? What interested you about well, I started him? reading Elmore Leonard novels, and I loved the way he wrote. There was something fantastic about them, and I just thought, what an interesting thing that would be to make a film about Elmore Leonard. And uh, I contacted him, and he needed to see a film in order to be persuaded that it might be a good thing. So I sent him the uh, film I'd made with Studs Terkel, Studs Terkel, Chicago which he liked very much. And so he agreed to, to do it. And, he, and it was an absolutely delightful man who the least violent guy in the world, he'd never owned a gun. Uh, and there we saw him kind of cu completely curious. He'd, he'd never been into that, uh, into um, the property room of Detroit. Uh, and, um, and what was, what was interesting uh, to me is that he had a, um, a lovely, sidekick called Greg Sutter, who did a lot of his research and, and was incredibly, incredibly helpful in during the making of the film. And uh, I realized that a lot of the characters in Elmore Leonard's novels were actually loosely inspired by different characters he'd encountered, whether they might be sort of coppers, you know, police officers in Detroit or a court circuit judge in Florida or a bail bondsman or whoever. And, and, um, and so uh, we had this thought that it would be interesting for him to be talking to some of the people he'd, who'd inspired his, his, the characters in novels, but then get the people who had inspired the novels to read a bit from the novel, which is actually loosely based on the character they'd inspired. And often, of course, um, um, they were characters with rather dubious morality or whatever, you know, so, but they enjoyed the fact that they, and they someone seemed to be rather thrilled that they had somehow re, had been given a new life inside an Elmore Leonard novel. And he was such a delightfully charming person to be with. And, and, uh, um, and uh, so there, uh, the form of the film grew out of that idea of trying to find uh, people who'd, uh, inspired the, the bits of the fiction, but actually he was talking to them and then they were reading the very um, sentences which somehow belonged to the character they, they were and the character he'd made them. He's a wonderful writer of dialogue. Yeah, and, terrific. Um, the, the idea that people are reading their own words to a certain extent yeah. is a great one too. Mm. <laughs> so, so, very, very different kind of writer than the others that you, that you've dealt with, or may, or perhaps not. Am I am I wrong to say that? No, obviously not. I mean, it's you know, very literary. Uh, yes, and and uh, you know, Elmore Leonard, I didn't know at all before I met him. But actually, I do have one of the the novel Rum Punch, which was one of the novels which uh, the characters were there in the film. Uh, and he did give me a copy of it, which was one of the nicest things to to Mike, who made me a movie star, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, one of the, one of the nicest little tributes I got. And I treasure, treasure that uh, that little dedication from D Dutch. In fact, he was called. I mean, Elmore Leonard is his name, but everybody who knows him called him Dutch. Whereas Studs Terkel, everybody called him Studs, except his wife, who called him. Uh, Oh God, what's she calling him? What's his real name? 
help, I've forgotten, I've forgotten, oh dear. But she was the only person in the world who called him by his real name. Um, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Studs was another, you know, another complete delight. And, and I think very important really when I met Studs, because in a way, the spirit of Studs Terkel, his curiosity about people, his wonderful oral histories, uh, his way he didn't ever separate, you know, huge cultural figures from people he just found interesting on the street. He had no social categories or he had actually no racism in his approach to anything. Um, I think he was an absolute exemplary figure who uh, I loved meeting and, and um, felt I'd, sh you know, there was something about his attitude to the world and attitude to people, which I think I felt inspiring too. By, I was felt inspired by too. But I think one of your most extraordinary films is, is the one about Latin America, where you actually use the writers to think about the whole process of uh, colonization and then decolonization. And uh, I, I wonder what led to that film, and indeed this wonderful ending with, with Marquez. Is it the end that has Marquez in it? I don't, um, I don't know. I, we, we don't really know what the sequence is, and, and it might go on too long. Who knows? But but that's, that's okay. very different, really, because um, I was asked to do it, and the only thing that um, was agreed was that there shouldn't be a presenter, that somehow we should dive into these cultures. But I was also making it with other directors, and so I was in that very unusual position of executive producer, which wasn't something I particularly was... I was a little worried about it. Uh, and it was a very complicated series to make. Uh, but I think it still uh, was made within that same spirit of really, you, it's going to be Latin America and the voices of Latin Americans themselves. And of course that gave rise to quite a lot of subtitles, which doesn't make it a popular movie. And I, it's this kind of film and a patch of series, which would no more be commissioned now. Uh, it would be the last thing that anybody would ever do. Uh, but it was- I mean, thinking about just thinking about your work, there's this extraordinary international range, in fact, which again is something we don't get much of at the moment, uh, certainly not on the literary side. Well, um, well, yes, I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, when I was at university studying Spanish, I really studied cinema rather than Spanish, but, but, and I don't speak Spanish well at all, I'm a hopeless linguist, but it did, in, in a curious way, um, influence quite a lot of the films I've made. And it was a culture that I enjoyed being in. And of course, going around Latin America is extraordinary because it's such a diverse 27 countries or something. So you think of Latin America as a single space, but it's multiple spaces. And I think the other challenge was to make uh, eight films, I think it was, and there were other directors. So it's by no means all my own work or anything like that. Uh, but the choice to do it as thematically. And I think that was, uh, an ambition, uh, you know, so you'd be doing dictatorship through the, the writers who wrote novels about dictatorship um, and uh, exile because, and you'd be with Ariel Dorfman or all sorts of other people who were exiled from Chile or, or exiled from Argentina and had to go somewhere else. So that, so that one took this with the experience of, and the historical experience of Latin America and trying to, to make films drawing on certain important theme, themes which had determined uh, a lot of their cultural output. That's and, great um, film. Let's watch a bit of that as, as a closing to this um, great literary adventure of the listening Mike did and who gives us this amazing I world. It, I think it probably starts, it's all about Simon Bolivar and it might start with uh, a sequence oh. from, uh, is it gone? It might start with a sequence from, um, a um, TV series about Bolivar. Um, okay, Dream of a New World. Here we go. Señores, si quieren presenciar los últimos momentos y el postrer aliento del Libertador, ya es tiempo. Entonces no le queda a usted ninguna esperanza. No he hecho otro bien sino la independencia. Esa fue mi misión. Las naciones que he fundado luego de una 
prolongada y amarga agonía sufrirá en un eclipse pero luego luego surgirán como estados de una gran república América sí, el mejor mensaje que se le puede mandar al, al pueblo venezolano aparte de la inmensa alegría de estar otra vez aquí es que no se olviden que esta es la patria de Bolívar que lean a Bolívar, que recuerden a Bolívar y que hagan en relación con América Latina lo que Bolívar trató de hacer y que le costó la vida. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ralph behind the scenes for making the clips possible, uh, and of course to Lisa and Mike, a wonderful conversation, I wish it could go on uh, considerably longer, and Lisa you're absolutely right, I mean we are in the concluding conversation sadly of this wonderful series, and you can absolutely talk about whatever you'd like to talk about, so I think it's great that you did that, and we covered the range of Mike's extraordinary body of work. I'm really glad that we uh, spoke uh, a little bit about uh, Donny Johnson, the dungeon art of Donny Johnson. That is, I think, uh, the title, Mike, that's correct? That's the, still the title of the film? No, no, the, fin the film is called Painted With My Hair. Sorry, Painted With My Hair. Yeah. And dungeon art of Donny Johnson is going to be the traveling exhibition uh, which for which we've got money from the Arts Council to put together. Um, Perfect. Will we make as soon as it's possible to put such things together in these troubled times. Exactly, film, uh, exhibition, and I believe a catalogue to go with that. So please keep an eye out on, on the channels that you would uh, watch out for such uh, work on um, for the film, of course, with the BBC, uh, the exhibition touring across the UK and perhaps beyond, and the catalogue attached to that. Uh, major new work from Mike, of course, we'd expect nothing less advocating, engaged, committed, just like our wonderful conversationist, Lisa. Thank you very much indeed uh, to all our audience for being with us. Apologies for several technical challenges earlier on in the evening, but please do stay with the Whitechapel Gallery. Uh, we will be back uh, after Easter with a new series of, uh, of course, film events, engaging with a new uh, strand of our programming called Ways of Knowing, Alternative Ways of Thinking About the World. Uh, for the future that we hope we can inhabit, of course, uh, given that we uh, have to change our ways and think about uh, different uh, and gentler ways of being on the earth. Ways, in fact, exemplified by Mike and Lisa with their wonderful wit and cultural engagement that understands the priority of things without treading it home too hard. It's that uh, delicacy of insight that we uh, value so much in uh, creative talents like theirs. So thank you very much uh, for enjoying this conversation, for being with us and supporting the Whitechapel Gallery. I'll be back on the 8th of April with the photographer Chloe Jew Matthews and the filmmaker Andrew Cotting thinking about the uh, the ritual potency of the River Thames. So there's something to uh, leave you with. I hope that uh, either appeals or perhaps appalls, in which case uh, you'll be somewhere else on the 8th of April at seven o'clock. But ideally you'll be with us on this platform uh, and thank you again to everyone at Whitechapel Gallery for making it possible. Thank you enormously to Lisa and Mike for this wonderful conversation, to Mike for all your films, to the audience for being with us, uh, wherever you are and whatever time zone you find yourself in, uh, do enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, and and uh, uh, bon voyage and all wishes to everyone. Keep safe wherever you are. Thank you very much and goodbye. Well, thank you.